You're listening to The Thrive Podcast, where every week we dive into a practical, tactical tip to bring you from a life of simply surviving to thriving. It's personal development for the everyday girl who is done with coasting through her days, done with feeling like she's missing out on the deeper meaning of her own life, and done with mediocrity once and for all. Because it's not enough to simply survive, you deserve to thrive. Welcome back to Thrive. If you've been finding yourself in a cycle of blah, feeling stretched too thin or stressed out and totally drained, you're in the right place. Best-selling author, researcher, and leading executive advisor, Dr. Aaron Reeves, has figured out real reasons behind it all and how to fix it. And spoiler alert, it does not involve more bubble baths or meditation. She's getting to the bottom of burnout so that you can do more of what makes you happy and less of what pisses you off, literally. In this episode, Dr. Aaron busts myths on women saying no, provides real tips for more energy in your everyday life, and introduces your own power-saving mode. She also breaks down self-concordant versus self-discordant goals to help give you back 90% of your time, seriously. You just might be mind-blown, and you'll feel a lot better, too. Stay tuned through this conversation. Drop it five stars if you like what you're listening to. And now, welcome, Dr. Erin. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yay. I am so thrilled to have you on Thrive. You are such an incredible speaker, a best-selling author. So can you give everyone just the lowdown on you to kick us off? Sure. Yeah. Um, So I am um, a lawyer in recovery. I was a lawyer for many years. (laughs) Um, but the work that I've been doing on inclusion and energy management and, um, making workplaces better and just making us better in the way that we work, um, and the way that we live, um, is something that I've been doing for the past, probably over 20 years. And so, um, it's been amazing to do the work and to keep learning, right? Cause things keep changing. And so I'm learning and doing that. I'm a mom of two teenagers, which affects my life a lot these days as well. <laughs> Yeah. And I, we were just talking before hitting record your book in charge is so, so, so good. All about energy management um, and really how to take back so much of what we might be feeling like was taken from us in a lot of ways. And I, I love how much of a tool it is because as I've gone through it myself, it's just such a powerful tool to help these badass women who I feel like normally feel in charge of everything else under the sun, feel more in charge of our own lives where we might otherwise be just feeling stretched too thin, too stressed out, honestly, just plain drained. Um, But instead of just saying, you know, just take a bubble bath or meditate more, you really focus on like getting to the bottom of it and getting to the source of why our energy levels are depleted in the first place, which is so awesome because I feel like it's like, instead of, popping a Tylenol every time you have a headache, it's like pretty darn important to figure out actually why you're getting them in the first place to heal it. So I love that that is so much of what you focus on. It's so helpful. Thank you for making such an awesome tool. And I would love to hear if you can kind of bust some myths that maybe exist around energy management and what that even means and walk us through kind of like the more realistic ways to think about it and apply it in our everyday life. Sure, absolutely. You know, one of the things that one of the metaphors that I've been using a lot is it's kind of like if you're in a canoe, right? And you're, um, you like, you know, take this canoe out into the water, and all of a sudden, you notice you have like five leaks in it. Um, And, you know, you spend most of the time while you're out, you know, on this lake, just staying afloat by like getting the water that's coming in through the canoe and like getting it out. Right. And, um, by the end of like five, six hours, you're like, I'm exhausted. You go back and, um, and you tell people like, I'm so tired. Like that was such a really hard day out on the canoe and people are like, Oh, take a bubble bath, you know, drink some tea. You should have a better morning routine. You should have a better night routine instead of like fix the damn holes in the canoe. Right. Because you didn't the goal of getting in this canoe and going out onto the lake was never for you to sit there and haul water out all day. It was to enjoy being in the canoe, enjoy being out on the lake. 
The problem with women's lives is those holes are relationships, right? Those holes are parenting norms that just suck for women. Um, the holes are expectations at work that are unrealistic. So after a while, it's like, I think we do try to fix the holes initially, but after a while, there's just this overwhelming sense of these are just holes we have to accept in our lives. And so we then accept that our lives are about, you know, making sure we always have a bucket handy, right? Or that we have girlfriends who get in the canoe with us and help us, you know, get this water out of our canoe. Um, and then we put all of these systems in place to say, yeah, like what, what I really want to do is take a bath when I get home. I need to go to my yoga class when I get home to feel better. But the truth is, you know that you have to get back in the morning, get up in the morning and get back in that canoe and you're dreading it because you don't get to enjoy being out on the lake on that sunny day. Your back is going to hurt because you've got to be like hauling this water out. So energy management is really about saying, do I need a damn new canoe? Right? Like, am I done with this freaking canoe? Um, can this be fixed? And not listening to what other people say about, can it be fixed? The holes are just part of what you have to accept in life, um, et cetera. Because, and this is where I talk about, sometimes we have to break the rules, right? And, you know, maybe the traditional patches won't work, but maybe you do have patches of your own, or maybe, you know, you buy a huge garbage bag and you put it all over the canoe and water doesn't come in. I mean, whatever it is, um, the point is that energy management cannot be about constantly being exhausted. It has to be about living your life in a way where you get to actually enjoy the things that you want to enjoy. Um, and reap the benefits of the hard work that you've put in and that you're not constantly back in that moment of just being tired from holes that you weren't necessarily responsible for creating to begin with. Yeah, that is such a good metaphor. And I feel the entire time I'm like sitting here nodding my head like, yes, because that's everybody I think listening can relate to this. And I feel like maybe some brains were just, some minds were just blown of people being like, oh my God, I didn't even realize that I had holes in my canoe to begin with. But like, yes. And I love, you quote Albert Einstein in the book at one point too, where you say, um, or where he said, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed yep. from one form to another. And I think that's just so interesting to think about and the difference in terms of, um, being in charge is the opposite of burnout. It's just the efficient use of energy. So like you said, it's like, we're coming from this place of being so tired and then feeling so burned out. And then just like quick trying to surface patch things where possible to keep going. And it's just this increasingly bad effect on our exactly. lives overall. And if you're not fixing the canoe or getting a new one or figuring out the root of it, like you said, it's not going to get any better. No. So, and, it's, and the other part of this too, is that, you know, like um, one of the things that came up when I was interviewing women is people were like, yeah, but you know, like boundaries and you can't, and there's so much that women read. Like if you look up self-care, it tells you a list of 20 additional things to do. And you're like, I'm fucking tired. Did you not get that part? Right? Like, stop telling me more stuff to do. And, or like, they're like, women need to learn to say no. And the truth is women know how to say no. Right. It's people don't respect our no's. Yeah. And so the whole isn't that you have a problem saying no. The whole is you say no, but people go, oh, okay, well, here you go anyway. Like, can you do it? Right. And I was just saying this to one of my friends yesterday. I'm like, you have to realize at the end of the day, either you're going to be upset or somebody else is going to be upset. Pick. Because yeah. if you say no and somebody says, oh, no, but you're going to do it anyway. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. So we go, okay, fine. But at the end of the day, you know, they just put another hole in your canoe, but their canoe is fine. So think mm. about that when you're tired. They're out there laying in their canoe, sunning, while you're, you know, shoveling more water out Open of the, the bucket. Canoe. 
because you were scared to hurt their feelings, right? So throw that shit out of your canoe, back into their canoe and be like, I'm sorry, it was not my problem. Um, but the the idea of energy management for women is about, it's this why, why like the first chapter, when, when I start getting into tools, isn't about, hey, what do you want to do? It's what's the stuff you need to get rid of in your life, right? Like, what are all the things you need to stop doing? Like, that's the start of the journey, not, oh, I need to take more yoga or I need to do more of this. You don't need to do more. Like, first get to all the stuff that's unnecessary, all the things that you should not do, don't want to do, don't bring you joy, exhaust you, drain you, and then sit in that emptiness for a second. And then say, okay, what do I want to put into my life that actually gives me energy, right? Yes. And we do it backwards. We try to add more things that make us feel good, but we don't have the energy to enjoy them. Oh, so, so, so good. If a listener is hearing this and she's already burnt out, already feeling it, what can she do today to sort of assess this, assess where her energy is going how to sort of rearrange it to still check off the necessary boxes, but start this process of cutting things out. Because I'm sure some people are probably eye rolling at us right now going like, yeah, but you just don't understand because I have this and I have to do it. And I have this and it has to be done. I can't just cut it out. So what's kind of like your practical way to realistically assess and acknowledge some of the things that maybe are a total pain in the butt, but like, can't just like, Cut yes, out the kid we don't live in a barter. Economy, whatever, we don't right. live in a barter economy, right? So yes, right. you need to have a job. You need to earn money. I mean, you need to pay your rent. Um, we don't want anybody, you know, neglecting duties. If you have children, yes, you do need to take them to school. You did all of that. Um, so I think the first thing that you can do is, you know, take a look at your calendar from the last week. Right. So whatever day you're listening to this, like take a look at your calendar from the last week, take a look at everything that's on your calendar. One thing that I have found to be really useful is to put stuff on your calendar. If you go to dinner, um, if you go work out, like put it on your calendar so that when you look back at your calendar, um, it's actually a really good uh, it's like a it's a diary right? Of, of, of how you spend your time. Now look at your calendar, take everything on your calendar and um, give it a number from zero to 10, right? Zero being, oh my God, you wanted to like poke yourself in the eye when you were done with that activity. And 10, it gave you a lot of energy. Um, and so at work, it, it's, you know, when we say we're burned out at work, it's there's things at work that are burning you out. Not everything in anything burns you out, right? So the, that one call that you had to take, that one meeting, try to give everything on your calendar um, a zero to 10, right? And before you start assessing, look at the week ahead, try to fill your calendar as much as possible. So for example, right, put in your calendar um, um, if you just sat there and did nothing for an hour. Right. And how much energy did that give you? Like put in your calendar when you went to sleep, when you went, when you woke up and how much energy you woke up with. Do that for the next week and then look back um, and say, what are what's everything on your calendar that was like a three or below? Right. And ask yourself, did that really need to get done? Do you really need to do that? And you'll find so it's not about quitting your job or you know, writing your parents out of your life or like, it's not these major things. It's, it's maybe like, if you have, you know, if you have a mom who you're like, oh my God, every time I talk to my mom, I realize like it was low energy. Well, fine. Maybe you go a week where you substitute three phone calls for just texts and you just say, I can't talk as much. I'm going to text her. Right. Um, Or maybe at work, it's not like your whole job. It's those particular meetings um, or it's particular calls. And you can just get better at saying, was that absolutely necessary? And then what the other thing you'll notice too is what are some things that are really giving you energy? Is there a way that you can do more of them, right? Like when I did this for myself, for example, one of the things that I found is 
if I got up in the morning and went to watch the sunrise, um, um, I live in Chicago, so over Lake Michigan, everything else that day seemed to have a high energy. Like I even like stuff that annoyed me, right? Like I had slightly more energy and I was like, oh, oh, but I can't get up early every morning. That's just not going to happen. So it was like, okay, when you can get up early and go do it. Well, now I'm doing it almost every morning, not because I'm forcing myself to, not because I'm some kind of program, not because I'm setting some kind of goal, but because I genuinely, my body and my mind want to do the thing that gives me energy, right? Because I'm just so tuned in. My body and my mind don't want to do the things that don't give me energy, right? And so you'll just get better at it, but this is not about doing anything drastic. It's not about changing your life dramatically. It's taking, being in charge is about being in charge for your life for the rest of your life, right? So it's about saying, Every day I'm going to do one thing that pushes my energy level a little bit more. Um, and so you come out of burnout the same way you went in one little day at a time, right? You didn't, you weren't great one day and burned out the next. You went into burnout really slow. You're going to come out of it really slow. You're not going to fix it any faster than you went into it. So kind of having that grace with yourself um, and not, making the don't make these goals don't say oh it's my goal to have more energy every day like it's not a goal it's just you're like I just don't want to be tired I want to be more energetic I want to have more energy I'm gonna do little things to get there yes that when you just said too about taking that diary of your day we always hear about okay mindlessly scrolling on social media whatever but if you can become more mindful of the moments that you are mindlessly putting your attention into something else, I don't know anybody who comes off of like a two hour TikTok binge and is like, wow, I feel so energized and fabulous. Like it, I think everybody has that feeling of like, man, I just wasted a couple hours of my life or like you feel more depressed or more anxious or just more blah. So if you can just tune into what, what is doing that to you. I think what an awesome tip that is. And even if it's like right after the activity happens where you're just aware, I did that in my own life not too long ago because I was feeling the same. And I was like, you know what? I was doing this one certain thing every single day. And I started realizing like, I don't really feel too great. I don't feel better after doing it. So what if I just like lessen it? And it all of a sudden it gives you more space that you didn't think you had before. And it allows you to put that put something in there and replace it with something that does make you feel good and energized and at a high, at a higher vibe. And man, like you said, it's like those small moments really add up. Absolutely. And you've got to keep in mind too, is that our eyes are not made to focus on something that's near all day long, right? We have short, we have long vision and short vision and our eyes need to go back and forth between the two. So if you're working by being on Zoom and you say, I'm going to relax by going on TikTok, you're not actually resting your eyes. So what will happen is when your eyes are looking at something close, your brain has to focus, right? But instead, like if you picture yourself walking in like a forest or just walking in a park, your brain doesn't have to focus. It's the longer vision comes into play. Your peripheral vision comes into play and your brain can actually shut down a little bit because you're looking at a lot of things that doesn't have to focus on one thing. Um, and it's like you, so you've got to just make sure that like little things like you're resting your eyes, you're moving your legs, you're stretching your fingers because the physical energy is as much a part of energy as, you know, the mental energy. So sometimes the reason that you don't feel better after looking at TikTok for two hours, it doesn't mean that like the material was necessarily bad. Cause I've had people sometimes say to me, but I'm looking at inspirational stuff. And okay, but you're still freaking crossing your eyes, looking at a small screen and your brain has to focus. Like it doesn't matter if it was inspirational. Like you need, even if you just 
stare at your ceiling for 10 minutes, you will feel more rested because your brain doesn't have to focus the same way. So it's about paying attention to, you know, the physical, the, um, um, the mental and kind of that, that emotional part. And there's going to be times when you're like, I just feel like I'm cooped up, get outside when you feel like that, right? Your body's giving you a signal. Um, there's going to be times when you say, you know, I'm thirsty, you drink some freaking water, right? Um, so it's like, the more you're on your phone, or you're doing things like that, the less you're getting the less you're listening to your body and your emotions. And a lot of the anxiety that people feel these days, it's because your brain is like, I want to go outside. I want to go outside. I want to go outside. And you're like, no, 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 no. And it is in a state of anxiety because you're not listening to it, right? Your body's in a state of anxiety because you're not listening to it. And when people say, well, I don't know what's making me anxious. I'm like, you, you are making you anxious. Like you just, I promise you're making yourself anxious because you're not listening to yourself. And a lot of energy management is just listening to yourself. Like, um, and I think we've lost some of our ability to listen to ourselves because we say, no, I'm, I'm going to relax by looking at Instagram or I'm going to relax by doing this. But your body's like, that's not relaxing to me. Can we please go sit with the sun on our face for a second put sunscreen on of course be reasonable but it's that kind of i think reclaiming is what i'm hoping in charge inspires people to do like it it's just you know what to do to be happier just do it you know um and the fomo and the just watching the numbers on whether whatever social media thing it is yeah those are I know those are traps that pull people into all different kinds of bad habits yeah yeah you're absolutely right it's like we just listen to the noise so much that we forget how to be still and sit and listen to ourselves because the second things are still or quiet or not begging for our attention I think sometimes we look for something to immediately fill it because we are, we get uncomfortable in the stillness or in the silence or without a screen throwing seven second videos every, every couple of minutes on in front of our face where like we are subconsciously filling it and not even allowing ourselves to take a step back and listen. Absolutely. And I think part of it too is, you know, I mean, this is throughout human history, right? Is Yes, it there's there's a difference between feeling like you um I forgot who said this, but um I think it's this author Wayne Dyer who said it, you can never get enough of something that isn't good for you. Right? So whenever you have something where you feel like I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more that means it's not good for you because your brain is wanting that from a perspective of addicting, like addictive type behavior. So if there's something that you can't feel like, whether it's like what whatever you do compulsively, it's not good for you because your brain doesn't want anything like that. Like, so anytime you feel like I can't stop, uh, binge watching television, for example, like I can't stop. I need to know. I need to know. I need to see the next video or I need to eat. I need to have one more drink. I need to that, that kind of like, and so you can never get enough of something that's not good for you. Right. Things that are good for you have a stop. Like your brain's like, thank you. I'm done. Right. Um, you know, when you eat food, that's good for you, you know, when you're done, when you eat food that's not good for you, you cannot freaking get enough of it, right? And so just sometimes pay attention to that. Like if it doesn't feel like there's an there's like a natural end to how much you can, how much you want, it probably isn't good for you. It's a really good indicator that it's an energy drain and not something that is giving you energy. Oh, that's that's a that's the real tea right there. Oh my gosh. I want to pop back to 
something that we were talking about earlier too, in terms of saying no. And you mentioned yeah. women already know how to say no, which is so true. Cause I mean, we're both moms. Like we, you know, when your toddler's crossing in the street and you're like, Nope, that's like hard. No, you have no problem in the moment putting the stop on putting the kibosh on something. So do you have a few maybe favorite ways to say no that are still clear, but maybe are a little bit more comfortable to practice with for the woman listening who wants to assert herself, wants to say no, maybe knows when she should, but just feels so itchy the second some the second she knows that's what she has to say and she does not necessarily see right now how to get in between just being like, yeah, no, and jumping around, beating around the bush to the point where it ends up not even being clear and getting lost. Yeah, uh, we cause ourselves a lot of confusion, don't we? <laughs> um, so one thing neurologically to keep in mind is women read faces more faster and in a more complex way than men do. It's why men can look at a woman's face see her upset and not react the same way. But women are highly tuned in, like our brains actually have more receptors that read people's faces. And we translate that into an emotion very fast, right? So it's why, one simple thing is, it's why like women, like when women, when girlfriends get together, we don't sit and watch something, we watch each other, right? So we sit like in a circle or we're facing each other. Or even like if you sit on a couch, you'll see girlfriends immediately turn towards each other and they're like sitting facing each other. Even if they're watching TV, they're actually facing each other and kind of, but dudes can sit at a bar, all watch a TV and be like, man, that was awesome hanging out together, right? Like they don't have to look at each other. And a big part of that is because that emotional connection of seeing someone's face is really important. And I know like I see this even with my daughter and my son. With my son, I'm like, look at me when I'm talking to you, right? And he's like, mom, I'm listening. I'm like, I don't care if you're listening. You need to look at me. Like, I need to see your face. And with my daughter, she gets it automatically, right? And part of that is because we don't process emotion really well if we're not seeing someone's face. So do not look at someone's face when you say no to them. That's it. Text, email. Do not say no to someone's face because you're reading their emotions and you're reacting to their emotions. And you know you're going to. You cannot turn it off. So take away the trigger, right? If somebody's like having a conversation with you face to face and they ask you for something, you know, you go, thank you. Um, I would love to do that for you. Let me check my calendar and get back to you. Go to the freaking bathroom if you need to and text them and go, I checked my calendar. I can't do it and put the phone away, right? Now you can manage that because you're not gonna feel as bad because you don't have a face that you're looking at that you're reacting to. There's no, I can't give you any way to do it while looking at somebody's face because it, even for me, it's impossible for me to say no when I'm looking at someone's face, even if it's somebody I can't freaking stand because it's, I'm like, oh man, like that, because your, your brain is reading and it's like, I don't want to make it feel bad. And then I'm seeing the emotion. I find I am the most beautiful bitch by text and I'm really fine. Like, I don't feel that angst of saying no when I'm like, no. And then what I do is I archive the text message. I don't even have to see it. And then if they respond, it'll come back, right? But even if they respond, I have to react to words, not a human face. So it's something that for women, just the moment of don't have to answer in that moment, just say, I would love to do that for you because that actually is true. Nine times out of 10, it's true for me. I would love to do that. If I had the time, I would love to take care of that for you. I would love to make your problem go away. I would love to help you. But let me check. And then once you check, if you're like, I can't, then you text it. 
That's such a good idea. I, I actually have not heard that one before too, but I'll throw in there. And if, if you're stuck in the face-to-face -face situation, what I personally found to help sometimes is to throw it back on your own capacity. And like you said, really emphasizing, like, I would love to do that right now, but I don't have the capacity for it at this time. Or like something like that, where it's like, you're saying no, but you're kind of putting it on you and, or, or saying like, I wouldn't be able to give it my best right now. Or like something like that, that kind of emphasizes again, it's a no, <laughs> but like, it's not necessarily just being like, I don't want to, I don't feel like it or whatever it's, but it's, still being truthful in the sense of like, if you have enough on your plate and that's not something that you can add on your plate right now, you can say that to people and that's, that's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that that, and I think for everybody who is listening, you should really have like a menu of things that you use. Cause some things are like the way I say no to clients, right. Is different than the way that I would say no to um, you know, someone on my team is different than the way that I say no to my kids is different than the way I say no to my girlfriends. Um, and by the way, the way you say no to yourself, right, is really important. Um, that's our first arena of practice is there's a lot of shit you're saying yes to yourself too that you need to stop. And that goes back to that I really, you know, I just really want to be on TikTok right now. And you got to be like, no, like, because it is, it's the part of our brain that is the toddler, right? Like you mentioned the toddler. It is the toddler part of our brain. It is the part of our brain that's like, but I just want to feel good right now. I don't want to do the thing that's going to like make me much better like a year from now. I just want to do the thing that makes me feel good right now. And saying no, and sometimes people call it self-discipline. Sometimes people call it different things, but like, no, like, no, you don't do that right now, right? And it's, so start with yourself. And I've noticed that there's a huge correlation between people who are sloppy with themselves and people who say yes to everybody else too. Mm. So put yourself in that mix of people that you're saying no to and ask yourself what shit you're saying yes to in your life right now that you are doing, that you know you shouldn't be doing. Right. And that's a good place to start saying no. Like, look at yourself and say, I don't have the capacity for that bullshit right now. Thank you very much. But <laughs> it's, and for me, for example, it's, you know, I'll get, um, I read like mystery novels and I know it's like midnight and I'm like, oh, I just want to read like, and it's like, no, because you're going to regret this in the morning because you don't get enough sleep and it turns into like, you're not going to bed till three o'clock in the morning. Not a good idea, but see how easily you override your own no. The, this idea of, you know, if you aren't capable of hearing your own no, right? How can you expect other people to? And there's a very strong correlation between getting better at saying no to yourself um, for the right things, right? You're not denying yourself things, but you're saying no. And then saying no to other people and being firm. Um, and there's there's just a strong correlation between not being firm with yourself and allowing other people to not take your firmness into. Yes. And honestly, I think for the recovering people pleasers among us if you can look at it as you know if you are already going into something that you said yes to begrudgingly you probably are not going to be showing up as your best self you're not going to be giving it your best it's not going to be your best effort your best work your best mindset any of that so is that really fair to them if they genuinely need help with something because quite frankly if you're like half-hearted if you're only half-heartedly in it they could probably find somebody else who's wholeheartedly in it that would benefit them more too. So if you're hung up on, but they need me, no, maybe they just need someone who's actually going to get the job done well and right. And maybe at a different point or in a different world, it would be you. But if you already are going into it with a sense of like, I really don't want to do this, then you're probably not the girl for the job. So if you can, if, if, if you're someone who I feel like really struggles with that, no, 
for at least for me personally, thinking of thinking of it like that also helps make it easier to be like, yeah, I can, I can, and I should say no to that because that's not, that's not what needs to be on my plate right now. Yeah. You know, and I, I've never liked the term people pleasing because it's actually inaccurate. You don't want to please people. You want people to need you. Oh, so and, good. And that's very different, right? You don't actually want to please people. You just really want the ego boost of people not being able to do it without you or people needing you or you being the first person that people call. And so it's actually like a people needing behavior. It's not a people pleasing behavior. And true people pleasing behavior is very altruistic and you don't have expectations. Um, But people needing behavior is you don't want them to call somebody else. And that's the damn reason that you said yes. Not because you really think you're the best person for it. You just don't want them to want someone else to do it. And so you will resent your way through it because you'll still be the first person that they call. And that is, it's a, it's partially because women are taught that that is where our value lies, um, is that that people need us like that, you know, in our lives. And I see a lot of moms doing it. They resent some of the shit they do for their kids, but they do it because that's what a good mom does. That's not what a good mom does. A good mom is happy. A good mom shows her children that there's lots of different ways to to be happy and a good mom teaches her children to be independent, right? Like not always doing the stuff for her children. And so, and I'm not saying that there's any one version that there's any one definition of being a good mom, but people pleasing behavior is actually people needing behavior. It's you want people to need you, which is why even though you're upset you're there, you would be more upset if they called somebody else. Oh, that's so good. That's and so good. Get the F over it, seriously. Yes. Because you're making, you have now decided that security or joy is this unjoyful thing. That's the that's the hole in the canoe, right? Like that's the, you. So you've created it for yourself. You've put this hole in your canoe by saying, "What makes me happy is this thing that makes me miserable." Mm. Instead of saying, "This is a person I love. I want to spend time with them that I enjoy," and they get to have other people in their lives that they love and call for different things as well. And it doesn't mean they love me less if they call somebody else. So I'm gonna say no, and I'm gonna trust that they call somebody else and guess what, they're gonna be fine. And there's not, it didn't diminish you because they're fine if you weren't there. And that's just a hard truth I think women aren't willing to say to each other. Like, you're not a martyr. Like that martyr behavior is because you really want to be the one that people can't live without. And as long as you want to be that person, then just get used to being exhausted because there's no energy in that. There's no energy in it at all, right? And in order to feel something that is truly giving you energy, you have to be willing to break away from the things that you're hanging on to like that. So that's, I mean, none of this is easy. I'm not suggesting it at all. It's much easier said than done, but it's that harder work of fixing the holes. Yeah. Oh, that's so, so, so good. I want to ask you something too, that I loved in your book, which I feel like kind of goes right in line with all of this here with regards to goal setting, because I don't think people necessarily realize like the energy management skills that are required in here and the difference between the self-concordant versus self-discordant goals that you break out in the book, because I didn't know this. I'm an Enneagram three and I've always considered myself really well-versed in goal setting. And I read that and I was like, oh my gosh, it makes so much sense. Can you break that down for everyone? Because I think that's yeah, going to be I mean, powerful. And 
without getting super nerdy, it's just like <laughs> exercise is write down a list of goals that you really want to accomplish and write down how many of those you would still do if no one could ever find out that you achieved that goal, right? If most people's goal lists fall by like 90% on that. So the self-concordant goals are goals. And, you know, one of the ways to, to think about it is, um, is um, you know, like um, I'm a writer and people tell me all the time, like, I want to be a writer. I'm like, no, you want to have a published book. There's a big difference between having a published book and being a writer. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, being a writer is, I was like, let me tell you the stuff I love. I could give a shit. Like, I've never wanted a book launch party. I've never wanted any of that. I love playing with one sentence until it's right. I love looking up 8,000 different words for this. I love writing and rewriting. That's being a writer. And I'm like, do you like that? They're like, no. I'm like, yeah, you don't want to be a writer, right? Because or when someone says, I want to be a musician, I'm like, no, you want to be on stage and have a bunch of people screaming your name. That's not being a musician. Being a musician is sitting and composing where no one is watching. And people who are true musicians are doing it whether or not there's an audience. People who are writing, who are true writers are writing whether or not they get their books published. Right. So being a writer is a different goal than having a published book. And the self-concordant goals are goals that you would want to achieve even if nobody ever knew that you achieved it because you can't help but doing it. It's what you do every day because it's what you want to do. It's everything else is like in the way of you doing this thing that you really want to do. Self-discordant goals are either society or whatever, you feel like I'm going to get credit if I do this. People are going to think I'm super cool or important or whatever. If I do this, and there is, there has to be room for self-discordant goals because we are so, you know, social creatures and we're part of a society and we need that. But if you really write down all of your goals and you say, wow, the majority of them are self-discordant, then you're going to be burned out, which means the majority of what you're doing every day is so that other people can be happy for you or that they can congratulate you. Okay? You should have a really good balance of goals that are, you know, self, that, that are just for yourself. For example, as I mentioned before, I go on a walk every morning. I take pictures of the sunrise every morning. And I send it to my daughter who's in college and my son who's a senior in high school. And I say, good morning. And I send it to a few close friends and I say, good morning. Right. And people say, you should have an Instagram account. That's like shows all the sunrises. You would have so many followers. I'm like, I don't want to do it for that. Right. That's the minute I do, it will become a self discordant goal. Um, I paint, I love painting and I've had, I've got a friend of mine who owns an art gallery who's like, I could do a show. I'm like, yeah, but the minute you do, I'm painting for other people and I don't want to do that. I do seminars. I do workshops. Well, I'm doing those for other people, right? So I those aren't about me. But anytime you're good at something or you enjoy something, if you try to make it into a commercial activity or you make it into something that other people are looking at, we lose touch with ourselves because so yeah, I take a picture of every morning, I take a picture of the sunrise and I'm sure it would make a great Instagram account, but the minute it does, I'm going to be waking up, making sure that my Instagram has an updated sunrise picture, not going to see the sunrise and taking a picture. And we just live in a world that is so commodified that people take anything that is beautiful and want to commodify it very quickly. You should do an Instagram. You should have a show. You should take your photographs and do this. And I'm like, no, or I could just send it to my kids and my close friends. And that's it. That I could just do that. Right. 
And the amount of people that will tell you it's not enough, but you could be doing so much more. You could be doing so much more. And it's like, no, there's plenty of things in my life that I do more and more and more. There's a lot of things where you can just do it for yourself. Um, if you cook a really good meal, you don't have to take a picture and put it somewhere. You can just enjoy it and eat it, right? Um, and I think the self-discordant goals have just become a real problem these days because we feel the need for other people's validation of whatever it is that we're doing and the ability to do really beautiful things for yourself without anybody else knowing about it is a skill that we can develop um slowly but surely every day do one thing that's just amazing and beautiful that you know everybody on instagram would die for and don't put it on instagram like it's just it's gonna be okay you get to yeah. just enjoy it for yourself um I, I, one of my cousins has a new baby and the other day this little child was giggling like I just could it, like I scared the baby was gonna stop breathing and just giggling and giggling and she ran to get her phone and I literally grabbed her phone and took it I was like no do not video this do not sit here and just listen to your child giggle until you giggle like I don't don't take a picture of it don't try to capture it don't try to put it somewhere where other people can see it just freaking watch your child giggle right and she did and she was in tears by the end because it was so contagious but it's that it, those kinds of things is the minute you try to capture it and communicate it it's no longer energizing yeah and I'm so glad that you went through all of that because it goes right back to what we were talking about in the beginning if anyone is confused or concerned about what they can eliminate from their life. I feel like if you just go through that process of identifying if it's self-concordant or self-discordant, and like you said, cutting out the 90%, that probably doesn't actually have to be there. Look at that. Now you have more time to actually exactly. sit back and enjoy your life. And guess what? You just got out of burnout. Yeah. If you get I rid of that. even just one discordant goal, your burnout goes down. The amount of burnout that people feel because of the self-discordant goals is it blows my mind. Um, and you know, just something simple. How would you wear your hair if nobody was going to comment on it? Right. It's probably going to take you a tenth of the time to do your hair. Um. How would you dress that day if nobody was going to comment on it? So the goals are not always like huge goals. They can just be how you present yourself, how you um, carry yourself. Um, and it's, I think, why going back to nature seems to be having such a resurgence. Because when you are camping, for example, you suddenly forget or you stop caring like what your hair looks like because it's you have permission to stop caring what your hair looks like, what makeup you have on, et cetera. Um, but all of those are all self Those are all like what we're doing for the outside world. And there's a place for that. I'm not saying show up to work looking like a mess, right? But do you have to do that? Even within that, do you have to do all of what you're doing? Yeah. I also love the idea of being in power saving mode, which you talk about. So I'd love to hear what your process is for getting into it when maybe you can't fully reset yet, but, or can't fully rest and actually stop, but you very much need to slow down. And you're like starting that activation of power, of power saving. Yeah. Um, I mean, I like learn from my phone, right? Like when my phone goes into power saving mode I've actually sat down and looked at it I'm like what apps are you saying you are not gonna do right like and I mean my phone goes it's like it's like I'm gonna let you text and I'm gonna let you talk but you can't do much else in power saving mode but it's this idea of like it, your phone will even tell you like I'm getting rid of apps that are unnecessary right and so when I go into power saving mode, I'll, I'll literally say to myself, like, what is unnecessary right now? 
And sometimes it'll be something as simple as I will have planned a pretty elaborate dinner to cook. And that's not necessary. I can grill a couple of chicken sausages on the grill and everybody who needs to eat in my house that day will not go unfed, right? And okay, that's power saving. Like, so it's like, I'm not saying I'm not gonna feed my child, but I'm saying like that larger, more elaborate dinner didn't need to happen. Or I'll sit down and I'll say, you know, I want to clean off my desk because I can't write when my desk is crazy. And I'm like, power saving mode is I finally got an ottoman that's like a, that opens. Sometimes cleaning off my desk in power saving mode means taking everything on my desk and putting it in the ottoman. Absolutely. Guess what? My desk is clean. There's nothing on my desk. If I'm not in power saving mode and I have energy, I'm going to actually go through all of it, sort it out, et cetera. But those are two different ways of getting my desk clean right? One is when I have more energy, one is in power saving mode. So it's, if my closet needs to be cleaned, thank God it has a door. Power saving mode is I close the damn door. I don't need to see it right now, right? So it's like, what does it, there's a lot of things where I need to clean my closet is sometimes I don't need to see a dirty closet. And I don't need to see it right now so that I'm feeling bad about it is what I do in power saving mode, right? Um, so I have a lot of things around my house where I can put things into it. And while it's, so like I have a task on my calendar to clean out my ottoman on Sunday, right? But until Sunday, if I don't want to deal with some shit, it can go in the ottoman and I don't have to deal with it until Sunday because I have a task to clean it out on Sunday. And I can deal with it on Sunday. So it's like, just saying like, there's things that you say, well, no, I have to do this. It's yeah, but do you really? Like, mm -hmm. what's the minimum that you need to do to feel better about it right now? And so when we say something like, I need to do the dishes, it's like, no, you really just don't want to see the dishes in your sink, right? That's different than doing the dishes. So put them all in the dishwasher, even if they're not clean and then you can like figure it out later, right? So the power saving mode is about still paying attention to your needs and not, you know, it's different than being off. Like power saving mode parenting is very different than not having your child with you or not being responsible for your child. Um, but there are times when I have a lot of energy when my son gets in the car and I'm like, play whatever music you want. There's other times he gets in the car and I'm like, sit in the back seat. Don't sit in the front seat. I don't want to smell you, right? He's a 17 year old boy. I like, don't want to smell you. <laughs> you want to listen to music, put your earbuds on. I can't right now, right? I'm still going to pick him up. I'm still bringing him home, but I don't want to smell him or hear him or you know, and once I get home and I'm feeling better or I'm, my energy level is back, um, I'll say, honey, let, I'm going to make dinner. Let's hang out. So the, the time I spend with him is really quality time. I'm there are 100 percent. But it's ridiculous for me to think if I've done three presentations in a row that day, when I'm rushing to pick them up, that I can be anywhere present to hearing what he has to say it's better for me to say to him I mean this is different when you have little kids versus older kids obviously but it's better for me to say to him I can't right now I need a moment and so you listen to your music I'm gonna listen to NPR and we're gonna get home and then I want to hear all about your day right and so just yeah, it's it's just about being real, I think, but in a way where you're not neglecting anything, but you're also acknowledging the ups and downs of your energy over the course of the day. So good. So real. So true. Erin, I have so much gratitude for you being on Thrive because I feel like this has been so enlightening and enriching for people listening. So thank you. My I want to get things wrapped up. By asking you something that I ask all guests on the show, which is what does thrive mean to you and how do you strive to thrive in your everyday life? Um, I think for me, thrive means 
defining success in a way where I feel good all day. And so success can mean a good nap. It can mean a good hang with my girlfriends, but that I get to define success differently every day to make it make sense that day so that I can feel good that day. Yeah, I think that's what that means. I love that. Tell everybody where they can find you online to connect with you more. And of course, where they can grab a copy of In Charge or your other awesome books as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously on Amazon and um, other like online booksellers. And you can go to um, AaronReeves.com to to read more about my books and to um, see some of my Medium articles there. And you can go, you know, if you if you Google me, you can go to what my farm does um, and learn about it. But AaronReeves.com is where all my books and my personal articles are. Wait, before you go, make sure you're subscribed to never miss an episode of Thrive. Drop five stars on your way out if you like what you just listened to. And come join the party on Instagram at thrive.podcast to stay inspired and thriving all week long. Thanks for tuning in. It's your time to thrive.